So if everybody hasn't signed in, we'd like to have uh, all your communication information so we can keep you uh, up to date on the progress of our, of our project. And uh, so emails, phone numbers, addresses, whatever you would like to give us, uh, please uh, put it on the, on the paper and we'll keep you up to date uh, as we proceed. Um, this morning, we are very, very lucky as we uh, um, begin this process uh, the Tomorrow Plan, and thinking what uh, Des Moines and our metro area, and quite frankly, uh, a much wider area all the way up to, to Ames and all around uh, a number of counties in central Iowa, and what it can look like and what we ought to be thinking about uh, is, is future planners and thinking 40 years out. Now, often it's sort of like planting a tree I see David Gunn out here, the, the things that we do today, sometimes we won't see the benefits of all of it in our lifetimes. But our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids, uh, hopefully through the efforts that we're going to put forward, not only in Des Moines, but all the surrounding communities and the county areas, uh, we will have a successful and sustainable future for them, and they'll have some of the opportunities and hopefully even better ones than we've had during our lifetime. So as we think about that, this morning we have Bill Fulton with us. He is the former mayor of the historic seaside town of Ventura, California. And, Kurt, and, and I asked him, I said, uh, Bill, when would you go out of uh, office? And he said, uh, Bill, where are you? Right over here. Six weeks ago? Six weeks ago. So uh, he's decided that there's something better than mayoring. And, uh, <laughs> I hope he's wrong. <laughs> I've got another four years that we just started Monday. So, at any rate, he is uh, currently serves as Vice President of Policy and Programs at Smart Growth America. He's a longtime expert in urban planning and community building. Bill came to Smart Growth America after a long career as an urban planner, an author, a professor, and a politician in California. He's the author of several important books on urban planning and economic development, including Romancing the Smokestack, How Cities and States Pursue Prosperity, and a collection of his economic development columns from Governing Magazine. Uh, as a city council member and Mayor Ventura, he championed the standards for high quality infield development, fiscal restraint, and innovative effort uh, to incubate high-tech businesses, a native of Finger Lakes region, the upstate New York, Bill holds degrees in journalism, public affairs from the American University and 
Washington, D.C., and in urban planning from UCLA. Join me in welcoming Bill Fulton. Thank you, Mayor. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't worry about it. Okay. Hi. I'm going to stand over here. Thank you very much. I just want to say there's nothing better than mayoring. <laughs> There's nothing better than marrying. It's the best job I ever had. It's the best job I ever will have. And if I could have done it for the next 40 years, I would have, believe me. Thanks for having me here. Uh, uh, thanks for putting on winter just for me. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Uh, it, it's really great to be here. Um, you know, when you're a politician and somebody calls you up and says, we'll give a speech in Iowa in January of a presidential election year, you tend to get the wrong idea, <laughs> right? Um, so I kind of assumed this is a, a wonderful building. I kind of assumed we were going to meet at a pizza ranch. <laughs> but then when I got here, I discovered that that, as, as Angela said, that circus has left town. And the way I knew that is that, um, is that when I got to the Hotel Fort Des Moines last night, they gave me the presidential suite, <laughs> which that's how I knew that Mitt Romney wasn't around anymore. Right? So I, wa I want to talk a little bit about, a little broadly, about some of the issues associated with growth and managing growth and development in any metropolitan region in the United States these days, uh, including central Iowa. Tie that a little bit back to the Tomorrow Plan. I want to focus, especially for those of you who are on the MPO board or who are our local elected officials, some of the things you might take, need to take into account and think about uh, as you think about the future fiscal uh, situation of your communities and the future prosperity, not just environmental sustainability, but prosperity of both your community and the region. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that is common to most metropolitan areas in the country, and is definitely true here in central Iowa, is that a lot of the growth, ch the growth drivers are changing. I'm going to get to that. Um, uh, uh, in addition to that, I strongly believe that long-term prosperity of any American metropolis requires a different approach to how growth and development occurs in the region. Um, we are not going to have as much taxpayer money, money, taxpayer money to build infrastructure and to provide public services as we have in the past. I think that has enormous implications for how we grow and how we manage that growth. And I think that um, a plan, a regional plan, not a regional plan that dictates to the local governments what to do, but a regional plan that you all agree on for the future direction of your, of your community and your region can help, especially if it focuses not only on environmental sustainability. And Frank said that I used to be the mayor of a, sea of a seaside town. So believe me, uh, sea level rise is a very real issue to me, right? Uh, because I was, I, as mayor, I had to calculate how long it would be before my house would be inundated. Another reason I'm moving to DC. But um, <clears throat> not just environmental sustainability, but economic sustainability as well. Um, the Des Moines area is in, very, is in a very good economic position right now, but it's a cutthroat global economy, and you have to take every, uh, you have to take every step you possibly can to stay competitive in the long run. So um, what's going on here? The, I'm going to show you a couple slides of things that if you are familiar with central Iowa, with Des Moines, you know this already. I didn't know this before I started preparing for this speech, the thing that struck me, I've lived in California for 30 years, and the thing that really struck me is, is, that, is that, this, that your MPO region, the four counties, is growing in population at California-like levels, about 15 to 20 percent every decade. That's a remarkably high number. Uh, that brings you great benefits. It also brings you great challenges. Um, Central Iowa is growing unevenly, as you know, so there's winners and losers within your region, right? And in addition to that, there's a big demographic shift everywhere in the country, including here, that has to do with lifestyle preferences, where the future market for housing and, and, for, and for lifestyle is going to occur, driven largely by the retiring boomers and by the millennials, who are the two largest demographic groups in the country these days. Um, you know this if you live here. I was surprised to see this, as I say. Um, you're growing your region's growing faster than mine. Your region's growing faster than mine. Uh, you're, you're adding 
uh, probably somewhere close to 100,000 people a decade. That, and that is foresee that's, that's foreseeable in the future. That's pretty surprising to me. Uh, you also, but it's important to know, you also know, though, that the population is not growing evenly throughout the region. It's growing much stronger, especially to the west and the north, right? There is a path of growth. There is a path of growth in this region. Some of you are benefiting, some of you are not, right? And I think that's a very, very important point to make. I want to go back here and make one point here, which is that if you look at these population growth figures for all the cities that are in this, in this uh, tomorrow plan study area, notice, and this is not percentages, by the way. This is raw numbers. I prefer to look at raw numbers. Notice that Des Moines itself, although it's the biggest and most important city, not really growing very fast in terms of actual population. That's not where the population is being added. The population is being added in West Des Moines, in much, much more to the west, and, a little, and some to the north. And as many of you know, I come from a farm county, and as many of you know, uh, as this development stretches out into the, into the hinterlands, it threatens and affects farmland. And of course, central Iowa is all about agriculture. In addition to being about insurance, it's all about agriculture, right? And uh, there are a lot, this, for, this map is from America Farmland Trust. A lot of people talk about this. You know, I have to say, I do a lot of work in the Central Valley of California, uh, which is the breadbasket of the world. It's the, it's the most productive um, farmland in the, in the world. Um, and a lot of people out there say, we can afford to lose some farmland. It doesn't really matter. We can sprawl, that's okay. Maybe that's true, maybe that's true. But I think you have to bear in mind that as you think about low density development moving outward into the, far, into the countryside, that does affect the available farmland that you have and it does affect your natural resources. That's not the primary focus of what I'm gonna talk about today, but I wanted to mention it, that, the, that, these, that these growth patterns have a ver wide variety of consequences. Okay, and, and maybe it's okay to lose a fair amount of farmland in the Des Moines area, and the entire Midwest farming economy is still fine, um, and maybe not. But you can see from this map that farmland that is threatened in Iowa is mostly right around here. Well, in, in my county, what we found was uh, when we looked at dropping below about 100,000 cultivated acres, uh, then you could no longer have the John Deere dealership. You could no longer have the agricultural support system. And so we put aggressive land use controls in place to protect the farmland, to hold it at about 100,000 acre, cultivated acres. Um, and that has worked somewhat. Maybe the most important thing, though, is that like in the rest of the country, the demographics of this region are changing in a way that is going to affect the housing market and how people want to live. You should be very proud of the fact that Forbes decided that Des Moines was the number one city in the country for young professionals to live, okay? Young professionals uh, desire a certain lifestyle, however, that it is hard, that, that, it, that historically has not been provided in the vast majority of the central Iowa region. Um, your Latino population in this region is 50% higher than the state as a whole, and the Latino population is growing rapidly throughout the entire country. Uh, it, it, it's an enormously important demographic driver. And I can tell you that retiring baby boomers, millennials, and Latinos all are trending away from traditional suburban development, some traditional suburban lifestyles, all trending away from that. In Southern California, for I live, where I live, the big question for people who own big, how, big expensive houses over the next generation is, who the heck is going to buy them? Who the heck is going to buy them? Because the buyers are simply not there. The buyers are simply not there. That's a very, very different situation than central Iowa, but it is an example of, of, how, this, of how this works. This is, a this is a chart of national, these are national figures. This is, uh, what you see is the four generations that we have on the left-hand side, the blue, that's the number of people in this country, in those generational categories, on the right and the red, that's the number of people in those generational categories who are in the workforce, 
you can see what's happening and what's going to happen. With all due respect to my parents' generation, they're going to die pretty soon, right? They're not working anymore. A lot of them, most of them either age in place or they retire to the Sun Belt, right? The Generation Xers, the generation behind me, the kids born in the late 60s, the 70s, early 80s, they're not very big. There aren't very many of them, okay? The two demographic drivers are here. The baby boomers who are retiring and increasingly, increasingly want to live in places where they can walk, where they can have easy access to services, where they don't want to have to rely on driving. And the millennials, kids my, my kids' age, under the age of 30, who, tr who have very, very, very strongly so far expressed an interest in a much more walkable, I'll use the term urban lifestyle, than, than even this group, and certainly this group. Okay, here are the two big demographic dr drivers in this country. They're gonna drive the housing market in the next generation. They are trending away from suburban living pretty strongly, both of them. Doesn't mean there won't be a market for suburban living among those groups, but that market is not gonna be predominant necessarily. Recently, the National Association of Realtors, right, not exactly a liberal, communist planning group did a survey and found 77% of Americans want pedestrian friendly features, 88% place more value on the quality of the neighborhood than the size of the house. Eight, almost everybody in this country places more, it, the quality of the neighborhood is more important than the size of the house. There's one other statistic here I meant to put up, which is not from the National Association of Realtors, but it's relevant, which is that in this country, over the next generation, everybody predicts that probably 80 to 85% of all the households that will be formed, and that's the housing market, right, will be households without children. 80 to 85% of the households to be formed in this country over the next generation will be households without children. What does that mean? That means yards are less important, schools are less important, and, and a kind of an active lifestyle and a lifestyle of where things are convenient are more important. Millennials especially, millennials especially, now this will change over time, right? Because some of them will get married and have kids, although fewer than in the past, some of them will get married and have kids. So these numbers will change somewhat, clearly, right? My daughter's 21. Um, she's very much of an urbanist in her thinking. Uh, she may, when she gets, but she also wants to get married and have kids at a relatively young age, which is unusual for her generation. So her thinking may change. But look at this. Only 12% of the millennials say they want to live in a, in, a, in a suburban neighborhood with houses only. Only 12%. What if, now that could double, it could triple, right? That what that still means is that this emerging generation, this huge generation, 80 million people, the vast majority of them are not gonna wanna live a suburban lifestyle ever. Spending all weekend on the riding mower is not their idea of a good time, okay? That's the housing market of the future in this country and in every metropolitan region in this country, including this one. Okay, so that is, and I, I cannot overemphasize the demographic inevitability of this market shift. We've lived for decades on the assumption that everybody wants to live in a suburban neighborhood with a big house with a big yard and a new nuclear family. And we've revolved, and it's not just in local government planning decisions. Uh, in the private marketplace, the home builders, everybody has proceeded on that assumption. And, I, and the message about the demographics here is that that assumption is not true today, and it will be even less true tomorrow as you think about the tomorrow plan. And so therefore, all of you, no matter where you live, for, you lo for the local electeds, no matter what community you're in, you have to bear this in mind as you think about how to plan the future growth of your communities and of this region. <sighs> 
What's common, though, in what all these people want is they want some kind of a sense of place. That could be in a big city. It could be in a small town. It could be in a rural town. It could be in a village. It could be in a, in a, in a town of 10,000, 30,000, 50,000, 200,000, a million. What everybody wants is a sense of place and a sense of community. Everybody wants that that often is, has a physical manifestation, which is something more than driving between your house and the mall and the office park. Okay? And we see this over and over and over again. And, and providing the opportunity to live this uh, life is crucial to future economic competitiveness everywhere in this country everywhere in this country, right? Because although Central Iowa is in very good shape economically right now, as I said, it's a cutthroat world economy. It's a cutthroat world economy. Uh, and in the long run, the jobs that are gonna drive this country to prosperity in the future are not routine, ordinary jobs. They are, we live in a world where companies are outsourcing accounting and legal services to India. Not just call centers. Anything, even the most highly educated, highly paid job, if it is a routine job, is going to be outsourced to another country. The way we're going to, unless it's a service, part of the service sector for the local economy, the way we're going to compete is by encouraging people to be creative, and bring creativity and innovation to absolutely everything they do in their job or in this, their business every minute of every day. The people who drive that economy, as I said, are not people who want to spend all weekend riding on their lawnmower. That's not who they are. They work long hours, they're creative, they want to have a stimulating ur urban lifestyle, or at the very least, a stimulating village lifestyle. I gave a speech like this not that long ago in Buffalo, okay? Buffalo. Buffalo has, uh, along with New York State, has invested hundreds of millions of dollars in high-end life science research. They have a couple big cancer centers. It's one of the few things they got going. And when I got there and I talked to everybody, I realized there was a disconnect between what the economic development uh, imperative was, which was attract and retain and grow these creative folks in, this, in, this hi, in these highly technical research skills, and the communities that the local political process were generating, which was three acre lots out in the suburbs. Okay? Those two things didn't go together. Those two things didn't go together. And afterwards, this lady came up to me. I grew up in upstate New York, as you heard, as Frank said. Afterwards, this lady came up to me in one of these classic Buffalo accents with the really flat A, right? And I don't, you know, I've been gone so long, I don't think I can imitate it. But she said, you know, you're absolutely right. These folks who come in and work at the cancer center, they work 12 hours a day. They don't have kids. You know, they want a, they want a gym and a restaurant and a loft, and that's what they want. Those are the people who are going to drive the economy. Now, not everybody's going to want to live that life, uh, clearly. But those are the people who are going to drive every metropolitan economy in this country, including this one, in the future. And that's a very important point to remember. And so what does that mean? Does that mean that everybody is going to want to live, or should live, or should be required to live in a neighborhood like the one we're in right now? No, that doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean that quality of place and a more, a more, not just a more urban setting, but a more village-like setting is extremely important in, cre in responding to the marketplace and also, and also providing the basis for economic competitiveness in the future. This is my town, okay? Like every mayor, I love my town. I think it's the greatest town in the world, right? And you can see why. We have this, uh, somebody once came to town and said we should build an extreme sports park next to our downtown as an economic development driver. And I said, I think we already have one. 
right? I mean, the guy said this literally, I was looking out the window, there's like 80 people surfing when he was saying this. <clears throat> this is a small town, a small city uh, in California, a small city is 100,000 people. A small city in, by California standards, but one that has a strong sense of history in place. One that has a strong sense of history in place. People love to come here, people love to be here, and increasingly, People love to, and increasingly, people love to live here. This is a typical, I'm sorry that this is, uh, I didn't realize the screen was going to be quite so big. <laughs> this is our 4th of July street fair. I tried to get a picture of our, of our, of our winter holiday street fair, which pretty much looks exactly the same. <laughs> Just so you know. Except for, except for we have these, except for these things that shoot water out and, that, and they kind of make it looks like snow, you know. Um, uh, people love to be in this place. People identify with this place. Even people who live in the suburban neighborhoods in Ventura, and there are many of them, love to be in this place. And increasingly, especially as they get older, these are people my age and older, they sell their suburban house in the suburban part of town and they move downtown because they want to be able to walk around. That's the retiring baby boomers. Now, there are great neighborhoods in this, in this region that provide this. Some of them are, are right near here. But does everybody have to live and work and play in a place like downtown Des Moines? No. Every region has many places like this that if they're strengthened and worked on and, and, and have housing added to them, they can respond to the marketplace. You've got one here, right? You've got one here. This is a great place. This is a great place. And it's in one of your fastest growing cities, right? And it's right in the path of growth. Do people love to be in this place? I think they do, right? I think they do. People love to be in Historic Valley Junction. This is the kind of place that people want to be in, and increasingly, that people want to live in, OK? And so part of the trick of planning for the future is not necessarily to force everybody to live in downtown Des Moines, although more and more people are going to want to but to make sure that your region has lots of places like this and fewer places that provide traditional suburban sprawl, which increasingly people don't want. If you talk to any real estate market analyst, what they will tell you is the, the biggest problem in the American real estate market is there is an oversupply of single family housing and there is an undersupply of different types of housing in different types of neighborhoods that everybody, that, that increasingly people want to live in. And of course, particularly in the suburbs, and I know this because I've been a local politician in a suburb, um, in the suburbs, it's the, it's the single family home, it's the thing that people are comfortable with, it's the thing that people know that, it, that is the result of the political process, right? But that's not necessarily what you need for economic competitiveness, and it's not necessarily what you, it's not necessarily what the market is trending toward. Okay, so I think one of the things the Tomorrow Plan can do is help you understand this and help you understand where opportunities might be in your region to create more places like this. Okay, and I'm going to get to an example in a little while, but I want to talk about one more aspect of this, right? <clears throat> Which is the fiscal consequences of different types of development patterns on local governments, right? Now, Frank, when he introduced me, said, uh, I was proud of three things. One was high, high quality infill development standards. The second one was working on high tech economic development. And the third one was fiscal restraint. Now, when I took office in 2003, if, a, if anybody had said, oh, you're gonna, come to, you're gonna come to make fiscal restraint a high priority, I would have said they're nuts. I would have said, no, my goal is to get as much money to the city as possible and spend it as usefully as possible. Well, over time, I would say in the last three, four years, all politicians have become fiscal conservatives, right? Doesn't matter how liberal you are or how conservative you are, you're a fiscal conservative of necessity. So one of the things that we have to ask ourselves, particularly as local officials, is what are the fiscal consequences? What are the fiscal consequences? What are, what's the thing that we control inside our borders more than anything else? It's how land is used and what it's used for, right? How land is used and what it's used for has enormous consequences for both revenue and cost. 
And so I think one of the things we have to do, and I think the Tomorrow Plan process can help us do this, is understand what the real revenues and costs are associated with the way we grow as a region and with the way we grow in our community. I don't know the current, you know, local tax situations from place to place are so different that it's hard to, under, it's hard to generalize, but I will generalize as follows, and I'd be happy to talk about this in more detail in Q&A. Low-density suburban development almost never pays for itself either for upfront infrastructure or for ongoing operation and maintenance and repair. In the end, usually, the taxpayers take it in the shorts for that kind of development. Okay? It's theoretically possible to make that kind of development pay for itself. That requires difficult political choices that most local governments are not willing to make. And the other thing I think you gotta do is think about what the, what the long-term cost of absolutely everything is. I grew up in upstate New York, so whenever I come to, a, to the snow belt, I love to, th I love to ask people, when I think about regional economic competitiveness, right? I'm from California, right? So, so I think weather is really important as in regional competitiveness. It isn't always. I mean, California is crowded and it's and it's expensive, and so you have you have uh, competitive advantages over California in that you're really neither of those things. On the other hand, when I got off the plane last night at 8:30 and I walked out of the airport, it was snowing and really windy, and I was chilled to the bone. I would consider that a competitive disadvantage to your region. <laughs> okay, I realize not everybody would, but I would. Okay, so, and then the more I thought about this, especially in going back to upstate New York where I grew up, the more I thought, the competitive disadvantage is not necessarily the weather. The competitive disadvantage, particularly in Buffalo where I went to college, is that, is that, um, is, is the perception that the weather's always fouling things up, right? So, so, in a snowy place, one of the most important things to do is to, is to have great snow fighting, uh, a great snow fighting system where, uh, you know, you solve that problem almost immediately. Well, solving that problem almost immediately costs money, right? And just like roads, just like water, just like sewer, just like fire, as I'll show you in a minute, the lower density development you have, the more money you have to spend plowing roads so that a very few people can get out. Right? You spend a lot of money everywhere in the snow belt where there's a lot of sprawl. You spend a lot of money plowing roads to help a very small number of people. And one of the questions you've got to ask yourselves, I think, is is that worth it? Is that worth it? Is that worth the taxpayer expense that's going to go into that? Is that really worth it? Maybe, maybe you think it is. But if you think it is, then you've got to be prepared to bear the fiscal consequences of that, okay? My favorite question when I went to Buffalo was, what's your regional snow fighting budget? And how can you reduce it? They had no idea. They had no idea. You know what their answer was? Well, in some places, the town plows the snow. In some places, the town contracts with the county to plow the snow. In some places, the county contracts with the town to plow the snow. In some places, uh, there's a private contractor who plows the snow, but then in the city, the unions won't allow that. So, so in other words, there was no regional approach to doing this, doing it well, doing it efficiently, and getting the price down as much as possible. And I think that's the kind of thing, that's just one service, right? But that's the kind of thing you've got to think about when you think about the long-term consequences of different development patterns, okay? What is the true long-term cost of building, maintaining, and repairing your infrastructure and providing all the public services that the public expects you to provide, okay? Here's another one. Here's another one. If you are, I just got off eight years of, be, of, of, of being on the board of a transit operator that ran both a fixed route bus service and a paratransit service. The subsidy for a fixed route bus rider was a dollar the subsidy for a pair of transit, a dollar ride rider was $20, okay? Every time we could get one person to go ride the fixed route bus instead of the paratransit saved us $19, right? Which we could put into more fixed route service. A sprawling development pattern where aging people live in low density subdivisions, in my opinion, is simply 
uh, creating this, a recipe for, is creating an enormous long-term transportation problem, the cost of which has to be borne either by family members or by the taxpayers. I experienced this in Ventura when my mother finally moved out there. She, of course, moved out there only when she could no longer drive, which meant I had to drive her around, I had to teach her how to ride the bus, I had to listen to her complain when the dialer ride didn't show up, and every time she wanted to go to the doctor and come home, it, talked, it cost the taxpayers $40, because that was the subsidy, okay? Do you really want to create a situation where hundreds of thousands of aging people expect a taxpayer-supported dial-a-ride service that will carry them long distances to do uh, ordinary things? Because that is the circumstance you are creating. Same thing is true for people who are disabled. I'm glad to see the Independent Living Center here. I myself am visually impaired. I don't, I don't carry a cane, although someday I will. I, don't, I haven't given up, up my driver's license, although there are quite a few people who think I should. And one of the reasons I'm moving from California to DC is so that I don't need to drive a car very much, okay? Everyone in this room, if you live long enough, will wind up in that situation. Everyone in this room. Everyone in this room eventually, if you live long enough, will stop driving. And then the burden for getting you around will fall on somebody else, either your family members or the taxpayers. Wouldn't it be easier if more of you had more choices late in life where either you don't need to drive at all because you can get around other ways, or if you do have to get around, at least you can go shorter distances. And I don't care whether that's in downtown Des Moines or in, uh, in some central part of West Des Moines or some other village around here, right? I don't care. As long as there are options for people like me and eventually like you to not have to, to, not have to place that burden of transportation, long distance transportation on other people and on the taxpayers. Because if you, if you put this on the taxpayers, it's gonna, it's gonna bankrupt the country. If you put this on the taxpayers, it's gonna bankrupt the country. And, the re and, and it's gonna bankrupt the country at a time when nobody wants to spend more money on it, anything. The Federal Highway Trust Fund, I don't know if you know this, this is what the, this is all your federal trans, federally funded transportation projects, you know, met, which run through the MPO here, uh, mostly funded by the Federal Highway Trust Fund. The Federal Highway Trust Fund is running it. The gas tax has not gone up in almost 20 years. The Federal Highway Trust Fund is, is running a deficit of eight, 10, 20 billion dollars a year currently be, being subsidized by the Federal General Fund, your income tax. Congress can't figure out how to pass a transportation bill. The transportation bill expired in 2009. They haven't passed a renewal. Why? Because they have to make one of these three very difficult choices. They've either got to increase the gas tax, which means that they have to persuade Grover Norquist that increasing the gas tax isn't a tax increase, or they've got to replace or supplement the gas tax with a different kind of a tax. The most common one being discussed is a VMT tax, vehicle miles travel tax. You can just imagine how popular that would be. The more you drive, the more you pay. Or the most likely scenario, they pull back so that you at the local level don't get any federal transportation money. And that goes only to building and repairing the national highway system. Okay. So this is just one example of at the same time that a sprawling development pattern is increasing our transportation cost, the constraints on the funding of system of transportation have become so severe that you're not going to be able to pay the cost. Here's an example. In both the, in, at the, both the federal level and in Iowa, gas tax has not really increased in 20 years, right? You've had a little bit of adjustment in the last few years. Your last big gas tax increase was in 1989, right? This is how much. So the combined federal and state gas tax in 1993, which was the last time the federal gas tax went up, was about 38 cents a gallon, right? That hasn't really changed at all since then. 18 years later, the effective tax rate is down around 30 cents a gallon, right? So 
your gas tax rate has effectively been going down. This is the argument to Grover Norquist, right? <clears throat> At the same time that, we, that every metropolitan area in this country, including this one, is putting more and more burden on the transportation system by building a more and more uh, low density development and generating more long distance commutes, putting more pressure on the interstate system among other things, right? Putting pressure, on, and, and there's great resistance in California too to increasing the gas tax, because we have the same situation, increasing the gas tax. And over time, the effective gas tax rate, the buying power of the gas tax is only gonna go down. Now I understand you're thinking possibly in Iowa of a two cent increase. That's not gonna get you very far back to where you were 20 years ago, is it? Is it? So at the same time that you put more pressure, more burden on the transportation system and on the taxpayers, the money available for transportation is going down. And remember, this doesn't even account for uh, more fuel efficient vehicles, right? Because that's the other thing that has thrown it out of whack. The more I drive my Prius, the better deal I have. The more I'm living off the transportation investments of, other, of, of, of people who drive gas guzzlers, right? The, they subsidize my roads because they pay more gas tax than I do. Now, um, this has consequences for a variety of public services. Here's a study that was done in, by the city of Charlotte, North Carolina, where the snow fighting is not such an issue. But they did a study, and they looked at two of their fire stations, one in a kind of a typical suburban, sprawly, cul-de-sac -y neighborhood, and the other in a more traditional, older uh, neighborhood in, a, in, a, in Charlotte. These are, the t these, these are the fire service areas of two different fire stations, okay? They did a study to determine how many households each fire station could cover and what the each station's annualized per capita lifestyle cost was. Now remember, the two, sta the two stations I showed you the map of were 31 and 2. And this is all the stations. But here uh, on uh, annual, annualized per capita lifestyle cost of the fire station, Here's 31, that one, and here's two, that one. In other words, this neighborhood is a lot cheaper to serve with fire service than this one is. And the number of households covered, again, here's 31, about 7,000 households. Here's two, about 23,000 households. Same fire station, okay? And again, if you look at the two neighborhoods, these are about the same geographical areas. One of them, the fire station serves three or four times as many households and has a fraction of the, of the life cycle cost, okay? Can we afford to do this in a, in a, in a world where people don't wanna pay taxes? Can we afford to provide fire service to neighborhoods like this when we could do it this way, right? When we could do it this way. I'm increasingly amazed, as I look into this, how much taxpayers take it in the shorts so that people can live in neighborhoods like this, right? And, and, and I am not sure that most taxpayers are willing to do that. So that kind of makes, makes, us think, may, makes you think, well, maybe there's a different way to go about this. Maybe there's a different way to do this, right? So if, uh, if the market's changing, and not everybody wants this, and we can't really afford this without raising taxes dramatically, which no one's gonna do, maybe we need to do things differently. So let me give you a little bit of an example of a case study, which yes, I admit it's from California, but it's the, from the least California-like region I know of in California, okay? I tried really hard to not bring you the Bay Area, okay? Sacramento, not a latte-sipping coastal metropolis. I have to admit, I have sipped lattes in Sacramento, <laughs> but it's not as prevalent as it is in San Francisco. It's a state capital in an agricultural area. It has a 
politically liberal central city and politically conservative suburbs. It has comparatively low housing prices compared to, the co compared to coastal California. And it is growing actually in population at about the same rate as your region. It's bigger, OK, because everything in California is bigger, right? But, but uh, other than that, there's a lot of similarity. There's very little reason not to sprawl, right? The, the Central Valley is 400 miles long and 50 miles wide. It's flat as a pancake. Um, and, and there is not a cultural desire to you know, be smug about smart growth, as there is in the Bay Area, right? About 10 years ago, they undertook a process like the Tomorrow Plan. Um, they called it the blueprint. And what, here's one of the most useful things they did. They, they eventually, they came up with a, uh, uh, as is typically the case in these plans, and I think the Tomorrow Plan will probably do this too. They came up with it, this was for 2050, they came up with a base case scenario, which was pretty much what happens if all the general plans get built out as proposed, or what happens if the trend from the past goes into the future, right? And this is a certain amount of population increase, probably comparable on an annual basis to what you've been experiencing here, but over a long period of time. Um, and you can see, so this is the base case, and you can see that the base case required urbanizing 661 square miles of land, okay? The base case required household VMT, vehicle miles traveled at 47 miles a day. And a, a big, you know, almost entirely uh, car oriented, okay? After a lengthy process, and remember, this is the MPO that did this, the Sacramento, Sacramento Area Council of Governments, is a cog, but, it's, but it is the MPO for Sacramento. They went through this process and they <clears throat> tried to come up with a preferred alternative. Now understand, this is not something that they have imposed on their local governments, right? It is something they have done mostly for their own transportation planning purposes, which necessarily assumes a land use scenario, right? Um, and so then they came up with a preferred alternative, which looks like this. And you can see um, this regional core is still developed, but if you go back and forth, you'll see on the out, there's a lot less development on the outskirts. Actually, the head of the MPO in Sacramento has a, my jo he has a slideshow that consists of two slides, and he just does this. <laughs> he just does this. That's pretty much right. Oops. But the preferred scenario, instead of urbanizing 661 square miles, urbanizes 304 square miles. VMT is 35 miles a day instead of 47. Car mode, car mode split is 83 instead of 93. Now, I'm willing to admit, I'm surprised at the walk number, uh, and that has to do with neighborhoods and, and, job and centralized job locations and stuff. Clearly, you'll never get to a walk number like that, right? Um, but that's not the important point. The important point is, if they pursue the, the preferred scenario, which requires local governments to make a lot of tough decisions, they can avoid urbanizing 350 square miles. And what that means is they do not have to worry about, for, well, forget about the lost farmland and all that, they do not have to worry about paying for, repairing, and maintaining, and providing public services for 350 square miles of new urban development. That is enormous cost savings to the region. Enormous. It's in the billions of dollars. Okay? Now, is Sacramento going to get built out exactly like this? Probably not. Are all the local governments in the Sacramento region moving forward to do this exactly as proposed? No, they're not. Right? No, they're not. Because you still got to get up on Monday night and tell Joe Schmo that he can't build that there or that it's got to be different or that the lots have to be smaller, or the thing has to be configured differently. And that's a tough thing for a local politician to do. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. But what this has done is created a, a region-wide discussion of the consequences of all the local actions. It also, and this also drives the transportation investments, right? And as you know, development's going to follow the transportation investments. But when you think about being economically competitive, in the global marketplace. And when you think about trying to keep the tax load as low as possible, imagine 
the benefit of not having to urbanize hundreds of square miles in order to accommodate growth. Now, does this mean, does this scenario mean everybody lives in downtown Sacramento in a loft? No, it doesn't mean that. In fact, most people won't do that. It, but it does mean building at somewhat higher densities in the suburbs, organizing things differently, building fairly high density development around their light rail, sta around their light rail stations, and I recognize they've got a strong light rail system, which you're probably not going to have, and I understand that. Um, it, but it means making little, little bits of tweaks all over the place, not only in Sacramento, but in all the suburbs and in all the older suburban areas, and con changing the configuration of greenfield projects so that they are not so sprawling and they don't generate as much VMT. Okay? And backing that up with a coherent s set of regional transportation investments that supports this rather than simply responding to the assumption of this. Okay, it means being pr more proactive in transportation investments. So I think that's a big deal. You know, this Sacramento region is probably twice your size in population. So, so you're, you're not talking about 300, saving 350 square miles of urbanization, but you're talking about a lot, hundreds of square miles. Wouldn't it be nice to, as I say, wouldn't it be nice to not have to build, maintain, repair, provide services for, and figure out how to pay for all those things for hundreds of square miles of urbanized land in this region. That is one of the things that's going to keep your tax rates reasonable and that's going to keep you economically competitive in the long run. I'm assuming this is what you're thinking at the moment. I realize you might be thinking, this guy's full of hot air. But I'm assuming that at least some of you are thinking, all this sounds good, what do we, what do, we do? Well, the lesson I take away from the Sacramento example and other examples around the country is just knowing this stuff, which the Tomorrow Plan will yield for you, is helpful. It, it, it sets up a conversation that you wouldn't otherwise have. And yes, you're, all gonna, you're always all going to do your local land use decisions in your local community. I understand that. I, I jealously guarded that as a mayor. I think that is obviously the local prerogative. But on transportation and infrastructure investment and on environmental protection, you're going to wind up working together, right? You're going to wind up working together, whether you like it or not, whether you like it or not. So this kind of planning process can lay the groundwork for A, what you should do on a regional level, and B, how you work together. And the third thing is, there is a way, I think, to take this stuff back to the local level and have a different conversation about what makes sense, particularly about cost, particularly about the cost of the infrastructure, the, co the cost of operation and maintenance of the infrastructure, and the cost of providing public services to different kind of development patterns. That's a different kind of a conversation that you can have in, back in your community, whether your community is large or small. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to get the amount of growth that you seek or that you think would be good for you. But it does mean you'll be able to manage that growth in a different way and manage it at far less cost and respond, frankly, in the long run uh, to a different set of housing market conditions that are emerging that we have not seen in the past. So this is where I say, you know, the great thing about being the speaker instead of the mayor is I get to go back to what I used to do before I got elected which is go around and give speeches saying, good luck and leave for the airport. <laughs> which is, I, no, my plane's not till this afternoon. So you have some great advantages here. You are in a very advantaged position economically now compared to the rest of the country. You have, relatively, you have stable employment, you have low unemployment rate, you have, you have relatively low living costs, you're getting a lot of pop for being a good place to live, good place to do business. Those are tremendous advantages in this, in this world today. And I guess partly what I'd say with the Tomorrow Plan is don't squander those advantages by assuming, by being smug about it, or by assuming that, that everything will be fine if you continue along the same path. To remain competitive in the worldwide marketplace over the next um, 30 or 40 years, 20, 30, 40 years, you have a lot of work to do. You gotta, you gotta, you're going to have to reinvent your economy no matter what. Every region and every city has to constantly reinvent your, their economy. You have to think about 
what kinds of jobs are reasonably going to stay in a place like this be, as opposed to going to, go to India or China or Ireland or Poland. Um, you gotta, and you've got to think about what kinds of people live here, what kind of educational needs they, they need, and how you link that up to the emerging economic opportunities. And you've got to think about both, in, both for businesses and for individuals what kind of built environment, what kind of communities they want to live in, and that will work for them. Because for people, remember, we've had stagnant incomes in this country for 10 or 15 years, people have to figure out how to live a lower cost life themselves, right? And if they use their cars less, and they don't have as big a house, and, and things like that, that lowers household cost as well. And that's going to be very important going forward. Um, and I, what I meant to say is you don't want your tax revenue eaten up to service low density sprawl. That will happen. That is happening. You may not even notice it, but I'm, almost, but I'm certain that it's happening is that little by little, you're, even if you add revenue over time, that your tax revenue will be eaten up by servicing this low density sprawl, especially, out in the, especially in the suburbs. And you all have to work together to get this done. You have to figure out what role each of you play in the regional economy, what role each of you play uh, in the emerging regional growth patterns, and how to work together to make sure that everybody's a winner, rather than having winners and losers having winners on one side of the region, not on the other, and having winners today but losers in the future, right? Because that, that's really what sustainability is about, is making sure that a win today does not mean a loss in the future, a loss to your children, to your grandchildren. I don't have any grandchildren. I do have four great nieces and nephews. I'm pretty sure that one or two of them will live into the 22nd century, right? So that is very profound to me in thinking about what the future really means and, and, and how, you, how you manage to be prosperous and happy today without trading away the future. Uh, not just environmentally, but economically in terms of tax cost and in terms of, uh, and in terms of, of income. So um, I'm glad that you've undertaken the Tomorrow Plan. I think it's a great opportunity. I think it's a great opportunity to, to think about the growth of your region differently. And as long as you're, uh, I guess, the, the, uh, being from California, what I would say is as long as you're growing like California, you ought to put some effort into trying to make sure you don't wind up like California, <laughs> right? With essentially an unmanageable pattern of growth. Or maybe more to the point, you don't wind up like Atlanta, right? Uh, where, where, again, where 40 or 50 years of, 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 of Sprawling leads to extremely long commutes, incredible traffic congestion, and very, very high costs for everybody. So I just wanted to say thank you. in a series of special presentations uh, regarding the Tomorrow Plan. And today on our show we have a special guest, Mr. Bill Fulton with Smart Growth America's Vice President uh, for Policy and Programs. He's a former mayor of Ventura, California and Bill joined SGA after a long career as an urban planner, an author, a professor and a politician in California. Welcome to our show, Bill. Thank and, you, Mayor. Uh, Thanks for having me. I think it's, it's exciting, and, and, and in regard to your presentation today, I thought you had some, some points that, that really helped us talk about some of the issues in, in city planning and how it works. Our issue as we try to work into it, obviously, is to take some of your ideas uh, regarding the problems with not using smart growth. How is it that we engage the public? That's a very good question because uh, uh, there, uh, yes, I have some ideas, but the ideas that are eventually contained in the Tomorrow Plan really have to be your ideas, not just yours, Mayor, but the ideas of, of everybody in this community and everybody in this region. And I, I, I don't think you can ever do too much engaging of the public. Uh, it can be difficult with a regional plan to for individual citizens to become very engaged and become interested. Oftentimes, though, what you can do is 
uh, and we saw this this morning, many of the groups that people belong to, whether they're environmental groups, business groups, uh, neighborhood or homeowner groups, whatever, uh, institutions such as universities and medical centers, of which you have many here in the Des Moines area, um, they can be engaged in the process. You can go out and talk to those groups and engage them that way. Is, is probably you and I both have uh, spent a lot of time on these issues of smart growth and, and climate change and uh, resource depletion and uh, going to future cities conferences around the world. And, and it's interesting to see how everybody talks about the issues. But as we come back to the United States, I somewhat uh, come to a pause because I think that, that hopefully just with factual presentation of why it's smart to do it like you did today, what are the costs of infrastructure, what are the costs of transportation. But really, how do we, we deal with some of those larger issues regarding the depletion and how we have a sustainable society for future generations, our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids? Uh I think you link them to the to the issues that are very important to people on a day-to-day -day basis. Something like climate change can be really abstract. Uh, even for me, you know, I was the mayor of a beach town in California where sea level rise was a very, very real issue, and yet it was very difficult to engage the population in a discussion about what we do about it. So <clears throat> I think what you have to do is take those issues and help people understand that they are connected to the day-to-day -day issues that are important to them. How much does, do, do, does my housing and transportation cost? What is my tax rate? How do I make sure that I get the services uh, in my community that, 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 that I think I need to have a high quality of life. That's why I talked a lot today about uh, the cost to taxpayers of uh, sprawling development patterns because servicing those development patterns in the long run, whether it's with snow plowing or fire service or whatever, can be very, very expensive. Um, uh, so I think, and of course, over time, if the environment deteriorates, Keeping showing all that up gets even more expensive. You know, sea level uh, climate change could lead to changes in the in the uh, rain patterns and the precipitation patterns and the runoff, and could cause more frequent flooding uh, right outside the build uh, this building here, right outside City Hall. Well, and of course, that's been <clears throat> one of our huge issues in Iowa. You you're seeing sea level rise, and we're seeing right. more frequent extreme events. Yes, and every time I just want to warn you, Mayor. Every time I've ever come to Des Moines, the river has flooded. So uh, you can expect that we again. Want you to get by that right. today. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to get out of here before that happens. But, <clears throat> but I, I think you can take those rare, very abstract the issues that seem very abstract but are very important, and relate them to the things that 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 affect people every day. Um, uh, uh, and 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 also, like you said, help people understand that this is a multi generational thing. You know, maybe we're fine. Uh, maybe our kids will be fine. Uh, will, will our grandchildren will be fine, or will they inherit a world in which uh, the water is rising, the precipitation patterns are weird, they have a lot of debt, they have a, they, there's a whole infrastructure they can't afford. Uh, that's the kind of thing I think we have to think about, and that's the way you have to connect to people as they, as they think about how to be engaged in a plan like this. We have had, over the past number of years, quite a bit of success uh, bringing the business community, the neighborhoods, and government together to try to define each of our roles in, in the future. But as you add the sustainability issue, certainly our issues, as you pointed out in your, your um, talk today, are somewhat different in the uh, inner city urban areas than it is in, in a suburb, for instance. But uh, an awful lot of those suburbs early on don't understand or haven't seen the reality of, of that far extended infrastructure, the sewer and the water and the streets and everything else, they're all brand new and so let's roll it out and if we have one or two houses an acre, why, you know, that's okay, I'll, I'll be able to take care of it. But it's the cost of maintaining and, and putting that up and certainly we've seen in the city of Des Moines uh, our denser population, whether it's in the business core or it's in some of the more dense neighborhoods, uh, it's easier to, to supply public transportation and do all those things. But how do we connect that thought 
And as you pointed out today, I mean, sometimes we look at VMT. How do we lower our vehicle miles traveled to and from? How do we get people closer to where they work? How do we make it affordable? And who knows what the future of, of travel looks like uh, 20, 30 years now? I mean, is it electric? Is it uh, something else? But we know there's certain depletion of certain resources that uh, has a pretty finite edge on it. And uh, how, do we, how do we talk to it? Should we use fear? Should we use, uh, uh, you know, an a economic model and say, you know, if you save a lot of money, you know, this is a better plan? I mean, what, what would be your best message for us? Well, I think, first of all, you have to work on having a sense of common purpose. It, it's easy for people in different jurisdictions particularly between sub suburbs and cities, and I've seen this in many places, to think that they don't have really very much in common and they are somehow in competition with one another. Um, that's not how I feel about it. That's why this morning what I emphasized was no matter where you live, no matter what community you are living in or that you are an elected official in, um, uh, creating better places and better neighborhoods and better uh, work centers through better design and, 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 and so forth is a desirable goal and it's one that, one that people want. Uh, and, and so that's one thing, uh, understanding that you have to work together. And the second thing I think is to understand for each community to understand the role they play in the region. Right? Des Moines plays a very important role in the region. West Des Moines plays a very important role in the region. It's, it's good to sit down and talk about these things and say what is your role, what is my role, how can we work together. I emphasized both the economic and the fiscal issues this morning a lot because I think that again is very important to um, what people can relate to on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, uh, what is the, and not just for the government but also personally, what is the, what is the best way to have the, the lowest, to have the highest quality of life and still have the lowest possible housing and transportation costs? You know, if you have um, a sprawling development pattern probably both your housing and transportation costs are going to be higher than they, than they need to be. And I think in the long run, you know, we are at a time of austerity now, and, and I said this morning that if you've, been, if you've been a mayor in the last few years, you've become a fiscal conservative, whether you like it or not, That's right? right? Um, uh, uh, so, but but I, I think in the long run, we have to understand uh, that we are in a competitive situation globally we have to make sure that we have both in a, 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 we have a, a cost under control both for households and also for public infrastructure. And so if we take the long view, and this is why I think the, having the business community involved is very important, the business community will understand what the competitive advantages are of this region. And we've seen that in the report they recently did. Um, and I, but I think that, that in the long run, understanding what kind of places you need to build and create, what kind of connections you need to make, uh, what the role of the different communities is, is very important in making the sell to the world that Des Moines is a, is a good place to do business and a place that has a, a role in the global economy. Uh, having uh, uh, participated in the, uh, the COP15 in Copenhagen, and being one of the mayors that was there, um, not only from the United States, of which there was five or six of us, but at the end of the day, speaking with mayors from all over the world. So we had sort of a mayor's talk about, you know, what it is that we're doing. And it was interesting to me to watch the conversation between the mayor of London, for instance, and the mayor of Copenhagen about how they were addressing some of their issues uh, uh, finite energy levels and, and uh, uh, climate change and, and all those issues and one saying and, and identifying that it is an issue but almost in a competitive way London saying we're going to be 30 percent better than 1990 levels by 2025 and uh, of course that was the challenge to the mayor of Copenhagen at that moment and she says we're going to be carbon neutral <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, but they, they take it on and they take it to heart. And you look at how they, they're thinking about transportation and how they think about uh, um, energy and uh, total energy systems in a downtown, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, like in Malmo, right across, to, you know, from Copenhagen, and uh, how they are, are thinking holistically, city, businesses, citizens, everybody, how do we make best use of our resources? And sometimes I think we miss a little bit of that as we come back to the states and we still have this, 
you know, let's keep doing it the way we were doing it for the last 20, 30 years. Uh, that, that worked before, why won't it work now? Would you suggest that, that we, uh, uh, com a competitive kind of a thing, let's see how, who's got the best ideas, let's trade some of those and do it in our region, I mean, and have neighborhoods. How do we engage all those people in that same kind of a battle that I saw between Copenhagen and London, but do it on a, a neighborhood? Do you think that's possible? I, yes, I do think that's possible. That has a sense of neighborhood or community pride. Um, uh, I also think it's important to make the point, and I think that this is something that, that, that uh, will benefit the entire region, that really every environmental argument is also an economic argument. If, 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 if Copenhagen's carbon neutral, uh, that also mean Copen means Copenhagen is more sustainable, more self-contained, uh, probably generating a lot of electricity on its own, energy on its own, a lot of it off the grid, ultimately doing that and ultimately do it stabilizing their energy costs and doing that cheaper. I, and so I think that, uh, uh, like I say, I think that not only should neighborhoods and communities and regions be competitive with one another to see who's going who's gonna to go the farthest, I think each of those communities can also say, well, how are we going to get our own costs under control? Um, uh, in Ventura, when I was the mayor, we, we had a, 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 we'd done a solar uh, project um, at our city yard, which took the city entirely off the grid. And then while I was mayor, we used stimulus money, federal stimulus money, among other funds, uh, to do another solar project that's going to take City Hall off the grid completely. And uh, I made, in, in down times investing in that, I made the economic argument that we are going to have total control over our energy generation costs at the major city facilities for at least 20 years. And, and um, you know, electricity rates are probably going to go up a lot in those years, but we're not going to be affected by it. So I think a lot of it is, as in London, as in Copenhagen, is not just setting a, an environmental goal that pe people can be proud of, but using that environmental goal to help uh, create a more self-contained and, and managed cost situation for the city and for the people who live there. One of the other challenges, and, and we have done some similar things in Des Moines, the facility you were in earlier today is a total remodel the of, old a, library. of a hundred year old building that uh, is, we hope, and we've got some wood around here, that it's going to be lead platinum. We believe that we have the points uh, a few more than we need to, to get there, and, but it was a real undertaking to get it there. But we thought it important in partnering with the private sector to redo a building like that, plus some of our own city buildings, to you know lead by example. But one of the issues is we, we do that and try to show that to business, who often businesses have, have a much deeper pockets. But when we go to the neighborhoods and, and we start talking to somebody about their, their house and a great deal of our, in the city of Des Moines, uh, um, housing inventory was built pre-1955. So it's got very little insulation in it, lots of stuff, uh, you know, good bones in the house. But how do we, we help them make that, 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 that transformation from a uh, relatively inefficient house into a 21st century one, and how do you do it affordably? And of course, that's been one of our challenges as we try to think about it, especially when we're retrofitting houses that are 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old and some even older than that. How do we induce or incent the private sector and the families into, into doing the right thing? And, and uh, uh, were you successful in, probably you're more attuned to air conditioning or maybe not in, in Ventura in those needs rather than mm -hmm. here in Des Moines, we seem to have both. Well, I think you're right that, um, uh, I think you're right that businesses will figure out how to do that because they understand the value of lowering operating costs. And business, successful businesses will, add, will be able to invest capital funds to do retrofits that will lower operating costs and see the payback. Uh, I think for individual uh, uh, homeowners and, and families, the difficulty has been the cost is fairly high, the payback is, is, is over a long period of time. We're lucky in, in Ventura, where I was mayor, we're lucky we're near the beach. It's a very moderate climate, so we don't, mo we're no, most 
homes do not have air conditioning. But in the uh, uh, but in the hotter parts of California, out in the desert and stuff, a very similar problem where um, cities that are, are, are houses that were built in the 50s, 60s, 70s have um, very old and inefficient HVAC systems, uh, and you, it takes far more electricity to, to, to cool the air in the house than it needs to. Um, there have been a variety of programs initiated by the state, and this has been true in other states, where either the state or sometimes uh, the banks or sometimes the electric utilities and sometimes together they can come up with mechanisms where they provide uh, the capital cost at a low price. Uh, at, at lowering the capital cost enough so that it's then worth it for the, for the citizens to, um, to, to do that, uh, to invest in the, in the retrofit. Uh, the mayor of Palm Desert, which is out near Palm Springs, also uh, was in Copenhagen. Uh, and that's where he got thinking about this, actually. And, and, and he came back and made a deal work with the state and with the electric utilities in, in which they have, uh, uh, they have now encouraged virtually all the homeowners in Palm Desert, particularly the ones that had pre-1980 HVAC systems, oh uh, yeah. to, to trick them out. And that's lowering yeah. overall energy cost, uh, both for the, for the communi community as a whole and for the individual household. So it, it's a matter of finding the government and institutional uh, capital funds uh, to, help, um, that, to help reduce that payback period so that the average homeowner will find that it's worth it. Do you think some of the private sector lenders uh, are, are reasonable partners in this? Because often, especially in Des Moines, when we have to do both, we have to heat it uh, more efficiently, we have to mm -hmm. cool it more efficiently, and we have these homes where you know they can get small loans or grants, whether it be from the power company or, or wherever, that's you know fifteen hundred dollars or two thousand. Which is not enough. And it's not enough because some no. of these retrofits are twenty, thirty thousand right. dollars. I mean, we're talking about doors, we're talking about windows, we're right. talking about insulation, we're talking about a new HVAC. And when you think about it compared to the overall value of the house, that's a big bite. Right. Um, I, I think the answer is all of the above. Uh, uh, the the electricity companies either do or are required to help in this in this regard. I believe you know, some of the federal energy money that is flowing down is going to help with this. And yes, I have seen banks in California step up to the plate, as long as all the other players are there. Basically, all the, all the players have to be there uh, making, this, making this system work. In, in California, there was a state law passed that, that, that sort of facilitated that. That has been, <clears throat> I'm sorry, very successful both in Northern and Southern California. So I think the banks have a role to play. Uh, banks are private businesses. They will go where they see a profit to be made. And I think with uh, both institutional partners and government partners, uh, they'll step up to the plate and, and, and join and help out. Um, it, it's been interesting in, in uh, the city of Des Moines. Uh, we have been uh, working with other cities around the country through ICLEI and through Conference of Mayors and some others to exchange good ideas. You know, obviously there are certain things in Albuquerque that they do uh, that we don't have the opportunity to, to get, but we are doing some things in Des Moines, but we're exchanging our best ideas and hope that that happens. Have you found any programs that you think are, are uh, particularly successful that ought to be shared? And of course, we are one of the uh, 10 beta communities on the, the STAR community program that is ICLEI and US uh, GBC, the United States Green Building Council. And uh, um, I, that's a very interesting program because it takes, uh, I think originally it was 81 different pieces of everything from uh, food sources to water sources to environmental uh, constraints, uh, uh, transportation, how you handle your waste, I mean every aspect of your community and uh, how you're going to do it. Of course, it's a, a long, deep, wide uh, study that needs to be made, but how do we, what do you think are the best practices that we ought to use and how should we share them? Are there entities or should we just do it as mayor to mayor? Uh, and well, we should definitely do that. Uh, and I also think that's where a little bit of uh, friendly competition comes into, 
comes into play, like the two mayors of the World Series or, or Super Bowl cities always, you know, betting each other. Uh, I think a similar thing can happen here, where, where the mayors from different cities and different communities can, can sort of engage in friendly competition to prove who, who's going to take, take this on the most. Um, I do think, though, that you're right, that, that a wide variety of national organizations, including ours, Smart Growth America, can, can assist in bringing people together helping them understand and learn uh, what the best practices are. Um, uh, one of the things Smart Growth America is doing is working on bringing together uh, mayors and other elected officials from around the country, such as yourself, uh, to share best practices. Uh, and also, that's part of the reason why I go around, go around talking about this. I, I think one of the most important things you can do, as you said, is to measure outcomes, to set targets and measure outcomes. Uh, so uh, it may be it may be energy consumption, lowering energy. It may be reducing the waste stream. It may actually be trying to reduce the overall amount of vehicle miles traveled, even as your population goes up, uh, which is um, uh, now a policy goal out in California. That's hard to do, but that's kind of a good proxy for for lots of other things that you're trying to do. Uh, uh, if you're trying to create a more efficient and more cost-effective and more environmentally friendly set of communities. Um, uh, there are certain drivers, of course, on, on vehicle miles, especially as gas goes up, it seems we see more carpooling and we see people <clears throat> thinking about riding bikes or moving downtown, for instance. Yes. But, uh, you know, somebody, uh, as you were mentioning earlier, if uh, they don't have the income, and they're out 30 miles away from their work, right. often their costs model... Uh, and they have no control over their transportation costs. Gas exactly. goes up to four or five bucks a gallon, all of a sudden they're, they're stuck. So I think, as I said this morning, one of the most important things uh, that, that communities and decision makers such as, such as yourself and your colleagues in the region can do is really understand uh, that that a lot of their constituents are in these situations, and that and that as I said this morning, the market for housing and the market for uh, a lifestyle of people of many different income groups is changing, and people are far more interested in living not only in downtown Des Moines, as I said, but in in sort of village or uh, more uh, compact settings, even in smaller even in smaller towns, so that they don't have to drive as far. Uh, so that they so that they can walk somewhere every once in a while if they want to, um, uh, uh, so that they have other options for getting to work if they live a long way from work other than driving, um, driving, driving alone. So I so I think a lot of it is aligning what people want or need today and what the market for housing really is with. Uh, with uh, the expectations and the actions of, uh, of local officials such as yourself and your colleagues in other cities around the region. Talk to us just a minute about uh, the future for what you do with Smart Growth America and any of the other uh, folks that are out there. How do you see what you do evolving? I mean, it, at some point or another, I suppose you, your land planners, your <laughs> community planners, your whatever, but certainly the needs are immediate uh, in thousands of places. I mean, in Iowa alone, you've got 947 cities and towns, and uh, every one of them needs a plan, and they need to understand uh, um, the challenges that are going to mm -hmm. face us in the 21st mm -hmm. century. But how do you guys uh, see moving into that arena in well in we well we try to stay a smart growth at smart growth america we try to stay in touch with as many localities around the state around the country and elected officials as we possibly can one of the things that we do at smart growth america is we provide a technical assistance program uh, in which either we come in or we bring in other experts to come in and help communities uh, that that meet the criteria uh, to to figure out how to do better planning and plan for the future. And many of these are small communities. One of the biggest problems, as you said, with 900 and some odd cities in, in a state of 3 million people is obviously all these cities are not going to have uh, the technical capacity on their staff, nor, the, nor the, the dollars to be able to hire the outside experts to come in and do this stuff right. So I think um, what we can do is, number one, provide technical assistance where it is, it is possible and you can certainly go to the Smart Growth America website and check out how you can apply for technical assistance. And secondly, um, the 
and secondly, stay in touch with us uh, through this emerging network of local elected officials that we are trying to put together around the country where people can uh, learn how to, uh, what the, uh, learn relatively easily how to do things differently and how to do things better. So our job is uh, helping people, our job is helping people, helping people uh, in their own communities, helping people learn from each other and, and helping people stay in touch with each other so everybody can do the right thing. I, I feel that one of our most important um, uh, responsibilities, uh, especially as we roll this out in 2012, is educating people. And whether it's uh, uh, the young people or the homeowner or the business people, how do you see Smart Growth America and others interfacing in that? You did a great job today uh, giving people sort of an understanding of, of some of the hurdles and blocks that we're facing in terms of costs and, and how we move people around and what the cost is of transportation and those things. How do we get that kind of a message most effectively out uh, as partners? Uh, mm -hmm. You and I working together on this and mm -hmm. your organization and our city. Luckily, uh, every now and then we have some uh, uh, mayors that are sitting in the bully pulpit that can help get the mm -hmm. message out. But how do we most effectively get it out across the whole community right. and the whole area? Well, first of all, we are you know more than happy to help you whenever and however we can, and I'm I'm delighted to be here. Um, and so far, the river hasn't flooded yet, even though I'm here. But but I guess beyond that, I would say, uh, I think we have to you have we have to learn, and it's really something any mayor does. You have to learn how to speak to the things that people really care about. Um, uh, the environment is very important to, to a lot of people and, and this is a very, and a better environment and a better protected environment is an important outcome. At the same time, uh, I've talked a lot about cost and a lot about economic prosperity being related to this and so I think there's lots of ways to talk to people uh, in those terms as well. Uh, that, 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 you know, taxpayers won't be as burdened if you have a different development pattern. So I think it's a whole series of interrelated messages. Um, uh, and there's probably uh, something for everybody to grab onto here. It's a matter of finding out, uh, it's a matter of learning how to talk to people, as a mayor does all the time with the constituents on, uh, on any issue, learning how to talk to people uh, in their own language, on their own terms, about the things that they really care about and how this affects them and this will make their lives better. Um, uh, you know, as a third term mayor, you obviously know how to do that probably better than anyone else, anyone else in town. No mayor can be successful without being able to do that. And so I, but, so I think that is how uh, that kind of message has to get across. Uh, I, one of my uh, uh, biggest successes and pleasures, quite frankly, is talking to young people. Mm -hmm. They seem to get it really quick. They and do. whether it has to do with their, their food sources in the school, uh, yep. you know, and, and I've even had them suggest that we ought to have greenhouses on the school and we'll, we'll raise our food and, and, and learn how to do that and then let's take it from there and put it in the kitchen and let's start cooking our fresh food in the kitchen now and, and then they take it home and they start telling the parents and so now the kids are greening the parents and, <laughs> and it's a sort of an interesting uh, mm -hmm. uh, web that they leave, weave to, to get a message out, but they get it so quickly and they understand waste, they understand uh, 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 whether it be waste in resources or waste in dollars and cents. The kids really seem to get it. And, and Yes, uh, I've, I've learned a lot from my own daughter who's 21 about, about local food, consuming local food, and seeking it out, because um, she's been very active in that uh, uh, during her high school and college years. I, I, I agree. I think it's because it, it's sometimes easy for us to forget that um, kids who are maybe in high school now have a much longer time horizon than we do. If, if, somebody, if we say that, that, that you're going to have sea level rise or water rise by 2070, that, does make a whole, that doesn't mean a whole lot to you or me. But to our kids and our grandchildren, that's tremendously important. And they can see it and, and they understand for us, this, uh, these whole sustainability issues are important. But for our children and our grandchildren, they are a matter of life and death. And I think that's why they see it so much faster. And I think definitely I agree with you that we should do a much better job of listening to them. Well, in some cases, it's not only a life or death in, in the, the climate sense, but it's also life or death uh, almost in the food sources that they mm -hmm. have as well. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense. Of course, here we are in Iowa, and you're, you're in the middle of a, a breadbasket that right. they, 
they raise food uh, 12 months a year. We have probably equally as rich soil here. The problem is, is that there's a certain part of the year that uh, we we can't uh, raise much because well, it's gonna, a little can, cold and it's you a little snowing. You can come out to Ventura in February when it's the height of the strawberry uh, picking season and have fresh strawberries. Well, but, we'll do it. <laughs> we'll do it. <laughs> All right. You know, I appreciate so much your, your you, coming Mayor. to Des Moines to help us roll out uh, our tomorrow plan and, and have that open discussion with the public and get them to understand uh, that, that we're not the only ones out there. People across this country are working on it, and uh, congratulations uh, for two great terms uh, as Mayor and Ventura, and good luck with Smart Growth America. Thank you, so, Mayor. Thank you so much. We hope to see you back in the I'll be back. Soon. Until next time, I'm Mayor Frank County. Thank you.